we were discussing when it was right or how often one should claim victory. Uh, I come from a revolutionary tradition where we had a slogan that uh, the struggle continues and victory is certain. But a group of friends and I became at one point so disillusioned we changed the, sl the slogan around to the victory continues and struggle is certain. <laughs> anyway. What I'm going to deal with today is really perhaps the story which might throw some light on that, uh, on that uh, paradoxical turning around of a, of a, of a, a slogan. And I've called my uh, talk, It's the Politics Stupid, and I'm looking at how a military mindset retarded the South African freedom struggle. Now, in doing so, I'm going to do <coughs> basically three things. I'm going to explore how, among militant opponents of apartheid, there were assumptions about what, needs, what means were necessary to achieve what ends, or to end apartheid in this case, over the 30 years to 1990. And I'm going to examine the effectiveness of how, of the main organ of, or organization of civil resistance in South Africa, which became known as the United Democratic Front, and later was called the Mass Democratic Movement, and I'm going to tease out a few issues from the United Democratic Front's uh, experience of civil resistance that might be relevant to discussion among us here. Basically, what I'm going to be doing is I'm focusing on South Africa and the history of civil resistance, in particular in the 1970s and 80s, because I think it's possible to understand the outcome in South Africa only if we really focus on this interplay between violent struggle and civil resistance. So I'm going to start off then, first of all, by looking at what assumptions were made at various points in South Africa and how they changed about what forms of struggle were necessary to achieve what outcomes. Now, if we go up until about 1960, from the ANC's formation in 1912 to 1960, the organizing assumption in attempts to end apartheid was that civil resistance, nonviolent assertive action, might induce its end. There was a Gandhian tradition, indeed Gandhi had spent his early life in South Africa, and that tradition held that civil resistance was the approach that was not just strategically more implausible, more, more plausible rather, not implausible, plausible, but also morally preferable. Now this assumption changed when state repression of civil resistance, particularly the Sharpeville massacre of unarmed civilians, over 60 of them in March 1960, led to an enormous sense of shock in the population at large of all segments and all colors, and led also to the outlawing of the two main black organizations, the ANC and another one called the Pan-Africanist Congress, which uh, fell off the map in the course of the struggle. Both of these organizations, the ANC and PAC, then embarked upon some level of organized violence, with the ANC declaring its reluctance to do so, and its hope that its first steps down the armed struggle path would lead the government to relent on apartheid, which of course it did not. Now it's important to understand the trajectory of the ANC's thinking on armed struggle. Back in 1960 and 61, when it first decided on armed struggle, it saw armed struggle as so important that it deployed almost all its most gifted political organizers, black, Indian, white, whatever race and background, two military roles. So all the most gifted people were sent into military roles. And this seriously undermined the capacity of the ANC and what remained of its organization on the ground to, in any case, uh, to its capacity to mount or further civil resistance or to solidify whatever political base survived the repression that was then underway in South Africa. By 1965, however, you can say that the ANC's internal organization had been smashed. And I mean smashed. One could count on one hand the number of individuals who were at liberty in South Africa working for the ANC or Communist Party after 1965, in the, in the next few years after that. Now, in these circumstances, that portion of the ANC that still existed in an organizational sense, that is outside in exile, moved quickly from a view that armed struggle was one of the means of struggle necessary to overcome apartheid, to a, view, to a view that armed struggle was the only means available to it, and was, remarkably, 
said to be sufficient to achieve that outcome of the end of apartheid in South Africa. Indeed, the ANC said, formally said exactly this in the strategy and tactics document it adopted in 1969. It says, and I quote, that armed struggle is the only means of struggle open to it. The ANC continued in this view in the early 1970s, notwithstanding the successes that were being scored then in developing civil resistance inside the country. There was the development of what became known as the Black Consciousness Movement, uh, young black intellectuals mainly who led it, particularly Steve Biko, who some of you will be aware of, I'm sure. And there was also a nascent black trade union movement, and these were both organizing by what we will call peaceful political means. It's the politics stupid, to return to my theme. Okay. The uprisings in Soweto and elsewhere that occurred in 1976 merely served to confirm the ANC in exile in its view that armed struggle was central or the only way of achieving uh, change in South Africa. And as thousands of young blacks left the country to seek military training abroad after this uprising, they were sent to ANC military training camps that were then set up in Angola. But inside the country, after the 1976 uprising, a different path was being followed. Autonomous anti-apartheid activists of various political outlooks had set about organizing politically in their communities to deal politically with problems that had been brought to the fore by the uprisings. While they were doing so, however, the ANC's armed struggle continued, but, it, important to observe, it remained at a very low level of intensity. By the end of 1978, some of the more far-sighted and, let us say, uh, sentient of the ANC's leadership sought to understand why it was that this armed struggle was being so spectacularly unsuccessful. And they decided that what they needed to do was to go and speak to that group of people who had, by all accounts, managed to defeat a very powerful regime militarily, a militarily quite powerful regime anyway in South Vietnam, and indeed a substantial proportion of the United States forces there as well. They went to speak to the Vietnamese. And they did so and got a shock. They, gave the, they were asked for a briefing by the Vietnamese on what was happening and what they were doing. They gave their briefing. The Vietnamese slept on it and came back the next day and said, you've got it all wrong, chaps. Your emphasis inside the country should not be on armed struggle. It should be overwhelmingly on political organization by political means. That is legal, illegal, semi-legal political organization. Armed struggle, the Vietnamese told them, could come later. This resulted in an endless stream of arguments in the ANC leadership over what mean of, means of struggle should now be supreme or was supreme. Was it military struggle, guerrilla struggle, or was it political? And to what degree should the ANC's military wing come under political uh, control and guidance and command both at the broad strategic level and a tactical level. And attempts over the, of the ANC over the next 11 years to 1990 to answer these questions uh, clearly were to fail. The ANC never did answer uh, the questions in any uh, degree except by default at the end when apartheid finally folded. Instead, what the ANC leadership went into from 1979 for the next 11 years to 1990 was in an endless procession of restructurings of its operational departments. And if you don't believe it, I suggest you read my thesis, which is available online. It is a, one of life's more monotonous stories <laughs> of endless attempts to change structures. The ANC had a remarkable approach to organization. Most organizations will set objectives and then design uh, structures to serve those uh, objectives. In the case of the ANC, they would create structures and then decide what to do with the structures. <laughs> now, I want to talk about the changing assumptions. What did happen within the ANC, however, from about 1980 after this visit to Vietnam, is that a few people inside the ANC who were thinking, and I wasn't one of them, so I'm not making claims on my own behalf here, not by any means, I was one of the thickies. There was a group of people inside the ANC led by a man in particular called Mac Maharaj, who's a South African of Indian origin, 
who, seizing on the authority that they'd got from the Vietnamese position on what was happening in South Africa, and indeed by some small successes that they'd scored with almost no resources, started working for political reconstruction in South Africa and did so in quite a creative way. And they did so in quite a modest way in the sense that they established links with activists working inside the country and started to build a small renaissance ANC underground which was steeped in political activity and community organization, trade union organization inside the country. <coughs> but their view still, even of this group of people who began to organize seriously for the ANC at a political level and in a political way, their view still was that the point of this political reconstruction must be that it should create a better basis for armed struggle. In other words, it should be the base on which armed struggle could be situated. Over time, however, they would evolve inside South Africa and in some more insightful quarters of the ANC in exile as well, a gradual realization to which many were disinclined, but they found that they had to accept, which was that armed struggle was no longer, could no longer be viewed as sufficient to get rid of apartheid. And by the late 1980s, and I'm running ahead of myself a bit here now, by the late 1980s, some of them were suggesting, sotto voce, certainly within my hearing, the revolutionary heresy that armed struggle might not even be necessary. Now, what was driving this trend besides the failure of the ANC's armed struggle? And when I speak of the failure of the ANC's armed struggle, I just want to give you one statistic, which I think is, might give you an idea of what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. I looked at some American military reports in about 2000, uh, halfway through 2004, early 2005, on the intensity of insurgency, of armed insurgency in Iraq. There were upwards of 5,000 incidents a day. In the 30 years that the ANC was embarked on armed struggle, it did not succeed in mounting nearly even a half of that figure. Okay? And people talk of it as an armed struggle. I think it is a, let us say, a very extravagant use of language to describe it as that. Can you repeat the numbers now? 5,000 a day. The ANC in 30 years didn't manage half of that figure in terms of armed actions. Now, okay, so I've, I'm talking about the, the paucity of the ANC's armed struggle. But as this paucity became more and more evident, as I say to more far-sighted individuals inside the ANC, there was patent success being scored uh, in the, the realm of civil resistance and in political organization by political means. And I want now to look at the United Democratic Front and Mass Democratic Movement, which became the main vehicles of this. And I want to look at how they rose as the ANC's armed struggle and its credibility and plausibility declined. As I indicated earlier, the response to the Soweto uprising in 1976 prompted a broad political response inside the country among black communities. There was a proliferation of organization building, civic organizations, parents' organizations, artists' collectives, trade unions, boycott committees, black business and traders' organizations, free Mandela groups, support groups for detainees, you name it, there was an organization for it. And these organizations had several characteristics. One, each usually served either a particular locality, a particular place, people in a particular black segregated township, or people gathered together around a particular set of common interests, traders, poets, whatever. Secondly, each of these organizations was usually a response to keenly experienced, practical, urgent needs or problems of ordinary people. There was almost nothing ever abstract about them, even the poetry. Each of these organizations was also built from the ground upwards, each gave rise to its own leadership. And this broad variegated base that was developing was or provided a highly creative source of ideas on tactics of struggle. And I believe it even added a few to Gene Sharp's list. And these organizations grew substantially both in number and reach 
through the late 1970s and to the early 1980s. And in 1980, with some prompting from Maharaja's political reconstruction department in exile of the ANC, the ANC was now, you could say, leading from behind, the ANC got or worked together with some of its activists, its underground activists inside the country to seek now to take all these different localized or interest-based struggles and to give them a national focus. And an opportunity to do this arose with a thing called the Anti-Republic Campaign in 1981, which was the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the whites-only apartheid republic. And the underlying argument of this national focus was that these many different kinds of organizations and whatever needed to come together and help in the development of a consciousness among people that the various problems that people were confronting could be solved in the end, ultimately, only by having a democratic government in Pretoria, the capital of South Africa. And, of course, the campaign provided an opportunity for the ANC and for the anti-apartheid movement broadly to undermine the legitimacy of the government by addressing the national political issue and to offer an alternative national vision. Now, two years later came a second opportunity, which was when the government tried to redraw the racial geometry of government, which would have given so-called colored or mixed-race uh, South Africans and those of Indian origin a greater, greater privileges than the black African majority and would have led to an even greater marginalization of the black African majority from the source of power. This was a set of constitutional reforms. And it was out of this that the organization called the United Democratic Front was formed. And the process of its formation was important to its subsequent resilience. And let me just make, highlight a few points about the process of its formation. What does that mean? <laughs> does it, does uh, was, that, was that a light coming on? Or? You made a brilliant point. Okay, fine. <laughs> well, keep pinging then, okay? Okay, I've already stressed the grassroots practical character of the affiliate organizations that would constitute the UDF. And in addition to that, what happened is that when, as the movement, as these organizations moved towards creating a national body, in many instances, though not in all, they created provincial United Democratic Fronts first in the various provinces around the country. And then they proceeded to a national leadership. So what I'm trying to indicate to you is that there was leadership at every level and the, uh, the national leadership was built in a sense from the leaderships below it. What central national leadership was created was small and highly mobile. It, considered of, it consisted of five or six people, basically. And this combination, particularly the basing of the UDF in grassroots organization at local and sec local sectoral and interest level made it highly resi resilient to repression. There are several other important points to note about the shape of the United Democratic Front. One, it was highly inclusive. Okay, its mo main slogan was, the UDF unites, apartheid divides. Its message was that all races, all classes, even young excitable white intellectuals like myself, anybody who opposed enforced racial segregation or domination could belong to it. If you compare that with other organizations with similar ambitions that were set up at the same time, one called the National Forum, they adopted radical rhetorical positions around socialism and this and that and the next thing, scaring a whole lot of people away. The ANS, at least the, the UDF also had the opportunity early on to adopt a thing called the Freedom Charter, which is a very eloquent uh, statement of freedom uh, aims and, and, and economic aims, political and economic aims, which I think is one of the few documents that rivals the U.S. Declaration of Independence in its eloquence. The ANC, at least the UDF, had the opportunity to adopt this for the UDF, but did not do so because it feared that it might drive away a lot of people in the black consciousness movement or liberals who might be alienated by some of the provisions in this particular document. The UDF saw its main weakness in these early days as well as being the fact that the largest and most powerful of the trade union organizations in the country, the democratic or the black trade union movements, 
an organization called FOSATU, or the Federation of South African Trade Unions, declined to join it at first. Within three years, this had been corrected, but this was an important weakness in the early days of the UDF. Now, during the successive local and national states of emergency that occurred in South Africa as these uprisings continued, and I'm not going to try and go through that history. I'm sure you're all aware that there were a series of uprisings in South Africa through the 1980s. Um, the UDF managed somehow to cling on, and it proved itself to be sufficiently resilient to do so. And sometimes, and I return to this theme of victory, just clinging on, just continuing to survive, can indeed be a victory. Okay? So... Don't be too scared of using the term victory, even in the ANC sense. Okay? Jeremy Seekings, who is, a, uh, I think, the foremost uh, historian of the UDF, has written, and I think absolutely correctly, he says, indeed, mass detentions and the disruption of opposition serve to increase the UDF as a symbol and as a mechanism of nationwide coordination. The fact that the UDF had invited such uh, repression and had survived it, gave it a credibility uh, and a following and a symbolic importance uh, which strengthened it. Paradoxically also, while the UDF policy limited the front to civil resistance, as uh, state repression in increased, the iconography of armed struggle plays a very important role here. Because many of the young, particularly black African youth, who were so much the sharp end of the UDF, got caught up with and were very taken up with and excited by the iconography of armed struggle. Wooden AKs, 47s, whatever you could get that had a, a barrel at one end or some sort of barrel at one end and a, what looked like a stock at the other. The, the, symboli the symbolism of armed struggle became extremely important. Now... I point this out because there is a paradox here. There is an apparent contradiction. Uh, you have this, uh, uh, the, re the reliance on civil resistance and nonviolent uh, forms of struggle, but the iconography of violence is a very powerful mobilizing element within it, and this, I think, raises interesting issues in terms of Kurt's address earlier. Now, this iconography of violence that emerged around the UDF suited the ANC in exile for two reasons. One, it provided evidence of support for it inside the country. And two, ANC operational leaders, as I pointed out earlier, still, in the main, wanted the UDF's political mobilization to serve as the base for armed struggle. On the other hand, the UDF itself benefited from this iconography of armed struggle that came up again and again and again in its demonstrations because the UDF derived a certain sort of revolutionary legitimacy from its being associated in parts of the public mind, not all of the public mind, but in parts of the public mind with the ANC. Now, as revolutionary pressures in South Africa rose, the UDF came to be formally outlawed in about 1988, but it quickly emerged uh, as, uh, under a new name, the Mass Democratic Movement, and on this occasion, it now was in alliance with this important set of trade unions in South Africa that I referred to earlier. So what was now confronting the South African government was a powerful, and, I, and more powerful than any other in South African history, a powerful multi-class <coughs> alliance uh, which was on the move and capable of exact, exacting considerable costs on the regime if apartheid continued, and indeed did proceed to exact considerable costs on apartheid. At this point, and I think it's appropriate to mention this, leading officials in the South African apartheid intelligence services stepped up their efforts, which we now know had been ongoing since about 1985, to induce the apartheid government, the government that was paying their salaries, to seek an accommodation with the ANC and its domestic allies, the UDF and uh, the mass democratic movement. Not doing so seemed to promise to these officials more sanctions, greater isolation for South Africa, and dissent, in what they saw, dissent into what they saw as be, probably being a gnomic disorder. 
they, these intelligence officials and South African business leaders, knew also at this point, because we're now talking about the late end of the 1980s, they knew that the more thoughtful elements in the ANC, Thabo Mbeki, the former president, whatever his mistakes on AIDS, is a man who played a, an extraordinarily proud role at this time, these intelligence officials knew that the more thoughtful elements in the ANC recognized that the end of the Cold War made armed struggle an even less likely agent of change than it had been hitherto. And these government officials recognized also that the ANC, through the kind of suzerainty or overall control that it experienced or exercised rather over the UDF and MDM, probably had the authority to deliver the black population to a settlement. What we can safely say is that civil resistance represented by the UDF and mass democratic movement was the most significant of any generated by South Africans themselves in the defeat of apartheid. They mustered unprecedented pressures on the apartheid state at levels at which, was, at, at levels at, at which the latter was relatively weakest, political and economic. The important point here is that civil resistance, and this came up, has come up before, civil resistance puts pressure on the state where the state is weakest, i.e. politics and economics or most vulnerable. An armed struggle, on the other hand, certainly in the South African case, and particularly armed struggle that is narrowly conceived and conspiratorial as the ANC's was, that armed struggle took on the state at the point at which it, the state, was strongest. The civil resistance that the, that the UDF and MDM embarked in, and those ANC members who were capable of establishing links with, with it and, and some understanding of it, was the means by which the ANC was rescued from the periphery into which its belief in armed struggle had confined it, or threatened to confine it. And the main role that the ANC's armed struggle played was that of a kind of political virility symbol for the ANC, or for some of its leaders. And this virility symbol and the legitimacy and authority that it gave the ANC, together with the ANC's inclusive politics, enabled the ANC to assume leadership over a body of civil resistance that it had played only a tangential role in actually producing. There's a sort of series of paradoxical relationships here. Now I want to just whip through a few issues which I see is coming out of the South African experience. So the first is the importance of seeking in civil resistance optimal inclusivity. The UDF stressed issues that united its wide potential constituency and avoided issues or sought to avoid issues that might prompt sectarian responses. Secondly, is the importance of organizing around clear issues of acknowledged importance to people in their actual real lives. And where you are talking about or pushing, putting before people the notion of seizing state power, or of dismantling the existing state power, then it is important to phrase that uh, redirection of people's energies in a way that they are quite clear that that address to state power is intended and they understand how it can address their practical problems. Furthermore, I think the UDF succeeded in planning substantially successfully for the resilience it needed to have in the civil resistance that, it, that it, uh, it conducted and waged and led. It had a decentered leadership which was highly mobile and that was an important issue. Fourthly, that did, it was structured in such a way that popular creativity was something that uh, found expression in forms of struggle, the use of humor and other weapons against the state of a non-military kind. And there are two paradoxes from the South African experience which I'd like to end off with now. The first is that it may be possible to advance civil resistance while many in one's ranks are proclaiming publicly the iconography of violence. Indeed, the iconography of violence may even help advance the struggle by non-violent means. I know this is one that people don't much like, but anyway, I think it, is, it happened in the South African case. And the second point is this, that it may be possible to advance civil resistance while the organization that sponsors one's legitimacy, 
and in the case of the UDF that was the ANC, it may be possible to advance civil resistance while the organization that sponsors one's public legitimacy sees the significance of one's political mobilization as lying only in its capacity to provide a base for armed struggle. Put another way, civil resistance may displace and supplant an armed struggle of which it is supposed to be, in the eyes of powerful others, only merely a tributary. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for you. Thank you for that for the presentation. First one um, for Kurt. You mentioned about this um, political thing, you know, phenomenon. Um, when we do have that sort of scenario or situation in, in a movement, country like Burma, uh, when we do have it, how do this uh, nonviolence movement should um, interact or collaborate or communicate with uh, other violent uh, you know, movement or organizations. So that's one question for you. The other one for you is uh, in 1969 when the ANC uh, adopted this uh, new approach to, you know, uh, for the armed struggle. Uh, I'm just wondering what are the reasons, what are the causes behind for them to, you know, come up with that sort of like new direction or new solutions. Thanks. Yeah, the, they actually adopted Armstrong in 1960. In 1969, they took a particular a new position on it. Um, the reasons why the ANC uh, um, adopted Armstrong, well, there were, there had been long campaigns to the, well, going back to 1912, but in particular in the post World War II period, the 1950s and 60s, or 1950s rather, really, um, the mass campaigns around uh, various grievances that black people had. These had met severe resistance, at least uh, repression, rather, from the regime. Um, and many people had been what was called banned, which was put under form of house arrest, and, and, uh, and many, many people had been jailed, and thousands of people had been jailed, in fact. Um, so there was certainly a frustration about where to take uh, the struggle to now, tactically, strategically. But I think that a very important part of um, the ANC's thinking at this time was, uh, let us say, the mindset in which uh, it found itself. In a sense, it was a product of its time. You look like a man almost as old as me, so you may remember, but there was a time last century. <laughs> there was a time last century when many of us thought that we could look at history and by looking at history, we could so privilege ourselves intellectually that we, can, we could determine which direction it was moving in, called Marxists, okay? And we thought that we had some inside track on where things were going, and we set ourselves up as the kind of what we call the conscious instruments of historical inevitability, and anything was possible and plausible and, uh, uh, in fact, guaranteed success for those who understood history in its direction and was excusable, okay? There was, a, there, uh, there was also a notion of the state built into this way of thinking, which was that the state rested solely on violence. The state didn't rest on consent or, let us say, uh, agreement or contract that rested on violence. So what I'm saying is that the ANC was part, very deeply influenced at this time, by Marxism and Leninism. Um, and if you go back to the 60s, uh, late 50s and 60s, there had also been, and this is a very important fact which is possible to lose track of now, but in the late 1950s, you'd seen this Cuban phenomenon. And there was some writing on the Cuban phenomenon, which I think was horribly and hopelessly inaccurate by Che Guevara and by a man called Freitas de Bray, which wrote out of what had happened in Cuba, the role of the various labor unions, people who'd been organizing in the cities by political means, by nonviolent means, for many, many years. But the particular interpretation of the Cuban struggle that was put out was that you can get 50 guys with beers and cigars, one or two berets, a couple of AK-47s, <laughs> land on the coast even if your ship sinks and overthrow the state, okay? even if Uncle Sam backs it. There was a feeling of, how would you say, omnipotence almost among Marxist Leninists at that time and anti-colonial fighters and strugglers at that time. And the ANC was very much caught up in this sort of discourse, for want of a better word. And I think that, so, Faced with the frustrations that it was, 
uh, as a result of the repression of its, of its mass civil resistance campaigns. And reasoning within this discourse, it was a no, it was a slam dunk, to use the infamous phrase. They had to go for armed struggle. They went for armed struggle, but they hopelessly underestimated the capacity of this largely indigenous group of whites, in the sense that these whites had been there for 300 years. They knew the landscape as well as, they weren't a bunch of colonials walking around in cliff helmets and cars that were too long for them and going red in the face. These guys had been around for centuries. They knew the landscape. And I'm afraid the ANC very nearly got completely destroyed. But to its credit, it didn't. What was the criteria that you used to determine whether movement was primarily violent or non-violent? As the South Africa case shows us, there's often a lot of interplay. In Mexico now, we have a primarily non-violent movement, and we're all thrilled. But there have been lots of movements like the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, which started as an armed movement, but then has not fired a shot since 1994 and is primarily a nonviolent movement. What's your criteria? There's often overlap, right? And there are often either contemporaneous movements that are outside but sort of fighting for the similar thing, or a movement chooses both, right, at the same time. And so those are both included in this measure of a simultaneous violent campaign. And um, really what we're looking at when we talk about whether it's nonviolent or violent is the methods that the campaign uses when it's actively prosecuting the conflict. So not like sitting in a room deliberating about what they're doing, because that's not a, not, not a violent activity. But when they're actually taking on the opponent, what methods are they relying on in the vast majority of, of cases? Right? Professor, oh, um, Sir. I'm Gaius, and I'm from China. Professor Burrell made a very powerful, um, you, you're Burrell? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I, I mean, the, <laughs> I'm the first presenter because your name is on the first. Um, um, so you made a powerful argument for a nonviolent struggle, and that argument is uh, contingent upon two presumptions. The first presumption is that um, violent resistance is portrayed as identifiable groups with armed struggle. So, be, so the groups may be ethnic groups like Tibetans or guerrilla, go, guerrilla warfare. So all these forms require a pyramid structure that is very vulnerable to governmental infiltration and suppression. So when you mentioned that government costs may be lowered, all these are uh, dependent on this on, on on this presumption. The second presumption is that you have a ten your argument has a tendency to portray violence as the entirety of resistors, violent resistors versus the entirety of the army, governmental army. So these two presumptions invariably <coughs> reaches the conclusion that um that, that violence is not a very good means to promote uh, civil to promote um, civil progress. So I would like to offer two scenarios that are not ca categorizable by the two assumptions. So the first scenario is in urban is in urban cities. Um, two, one year, two years ago, a person named uh, Yang Jia. Who is just who who had who had no means to redress his um, civil his, his, his he was he was very wrong he had had no means to redress his case, and he used a knife and went to the police station, killing six policemen. He did not kill any women policemen. He killed just male policemen, and he was hailed as the hero of China. Okay, and by doing so, all the Police stations across the country increase their um, increase their, their their protection, and that burdens the government. The second scenario is in countryside. In China, if you want to use the army to suppress resistance, you have to get permission from the Central Committee, Central Military Committee in Beijing, and the 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 time for information gathering. Reporting, processing, and decision making may require at least two hours. And in those two hours, and in the two hours, it's the action time for the villagers. So across across the country, 
last year, um, mass incidents, there, there were 320,000 mass incidents. And many, many cases are, were winning cases. The villagers can gather together very quickly and flip over the police cars and beat the policemen because the army is not here. When the army comes, the people just disappear. Although there are some repercussions, but still, that heroic act sends out message and excitement for people. So my, my argument is that in extremely oppressive regimes, individually operated groups resorting to violence, nonviolence, or both can and only can create more space for nonviolent actions. It is done by sending out excitement and message calling to resistors, calling for all forms of resistance, and by expanding the cost of the government. So I think this, uh, my argument also um, resolves the, the two paradoxes that um, Professor Barrell mentioned. To round up my argument, I would like to um, mention two things to, that, were, that merit further discussion. The first is the recognition of the existence of violence. Um, because in real politics, no matter how much the nonviolent people talk about nonviolent struggles, there are people who are determined to resort to violence. In micro, in macro level, in many countries, in the countries that you surveyed, we see nonviolent struggles making peaceful transitions. In those countries, in macro level, it's peaceful. But in micro level, in each scenario, in each street cases, there are violence. So I think the way to promote nonviolence is to create charismatic leadership, to build a team for the leaders to have vision, passion, integrity, and all these things in order to reduce the, um, the, 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 the tendency towards violent struggle. But these things, these street actions, these team building skills and knowledges are not mentioned by preceding lectures by Professor Merriam um, and, and, and others. Okay, the second um, point to make is the recognition. Uh, maybe let them respond to that question. I'm just thinking in terms uh, of Just one sentence. Excellent. That's perfect. Okay, the second, the second is the recognition of short lived span of, uh, of these um, independently operated, operated struggle. Because uh, this calls for the activists to, I, mean, I think this call because these struggles are marginalized, and this calls for the activists to use internet in forming various communities that may become civil organizations after the transition, to, or during the transition, to help maintain stability and prosperity. Thank you. Just on the side issue that Gaius talked about with respect to vision and charisma, I would argue that there's a substantial difference between vision and charisma. Vision is about the society one wishes to have as well as what the people need to do in order to obtain that society through action. Charisma, to the extent that you're thinking of charisma as a model of leadership that is typically historically associated with insurrectionary campaigns and movements of whatever sort, um, may in fact not always operate to permit genuine ascertainment of what the people wish and broad-based participation by the people. So I would argue as a, as a I'm not suggesting that, that, that this is an unassailable premise or, or, or point, but I would argue that it should be considered that it may well be historically, <coughs> since the whole phenomenon of civil resistance is still emerging and is not yet fully as emerged and in some respects as able to be analyzed as that of violent insurrection, it may well be that the full requirements of success in civil resistance require uh, a different concept of leadership than is passed to us from the violent insurrectionary model in which charisma, personal charisma, here is what I have heroically accomplished here is who I have dispatched, who here, the, 
you see the jet fighter, all the marks on the fuselage of the jet fighter of all the kills they've had. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the measure, the quantitative measure of the heroism. You have a different, a slightly different concept of leadership that may be emerging in the form of resistance movements in terms of civil resistance. A final question, then we're off the lecture. Uh, Jim. May I just add one point to the discussion? That is this, that violence today, especially as uh, promulgated out of Western civilization, in its war form, its structural forms, in its personal forms, especially domestic violence, is the number one enemy to the possibilities of the human race. <laughs> in its destruction, especially, of the women and children of the last hundred years. So it, it's, as a moral philosophy, there has to be a re-examination, it seems to me, of the, of the levels and the roles of violence in us and among us in the world. Thank you. I, I just want to add, I know I'm but also a gender analysis and class analysis because these resistance movements that are being described as you know a, a cost benefit analysis or comparative advantage don't take into effect that women are much less likely for example to rise up with arms so that it's not even really a, a conversation that is inclusive in its premises so I think there's a lot of missing components to the conversations really thus far, not just your presentation, but there's almost a kind of machismo that is building over time um, in, in, in the progress of the past two days. No, I, I, I mean, take arms. I, to, a extent, 